As the 1940s came to a close, both the United States Navy and Air Force were researching next-generation aircraft that could operate at supersonic speeds. The so-called sound barrier had been broken by Chuck Yeager in the Bell X-1, but this craft's design was inefficient, using a rocket-powered engine that burned fuel at a phenomenal rate to make supersonic speeds. It wouldn't be practical for varied and sustained applications. Leading industry engineers trying to develop supersonic craft were still encountering problems. Even the best proposed designs yielded test results that indicated an inability to perform at supersonic and even mid to high transonic speeds. The sharp drag increase at speeds approaching Mach 1 was proving to be an insurmountable barrier, the sound barrier, if you will, for the planes of the time. The solution to this problem was conceived by aerodynamicist Richard Whitcomb, who at the time was working at the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. His answer was a revolutionary advancement in the field of transonic and supersonic flight and is still influencing airplane design to this day. Its name, the Area Rule. The Area Rule states that any two airplanes of the same longitudinal cross-sectional area distribution will have the same wave drag, independent of how that area is distributed laterally, i.e. fuselage or wings. Furthermore, the rule states that to avoid the formation of strong shock waves, the total area distribution must be smooth. We will first discuss area distribution and then explain how an aircraft's performance can be loosely determined from it. Here is the ideal graph of cross-sectional area distribution. On the y-axis, we have cross-sectional area, and on the x-axis, we have the fuselage station. This is basically how far along you are on the plane, with the nose being on the left and the tail being on the right. To better visualize how the shape of the plane is translated to this graph, I have here an embarrassingly crude LEGO airplane. What I'm going to do is split it up into a series of cross sections, like so. Now that the plane is all divided, what I can do is measure the area of each one of these sections, and then plot it on a graph. This will allow us to see how the area is distributed along the length of the plane, and from that, we can get a rough idea of its aerodynamic viability. So here's our graph, same axis as before, cross-sectional area on the Y, and our fuselage station on the X. Now, as I draw on our ideal line, you can clearly see that this plane would be awfully inefficient in supersonic flight. I mean, it is made of Lego, after all. Now, why exactly is this distribution bad? The answer to this deals with drag, more specifically, wave drag. Drag is a force acting on an object opposite to its motion. In our case, it is the force of the air pushing against the plane. According to Newton's third law, the two operate as an action-reaction pair. As the plane goes faster and pushes harder against the air, the air pushes back with equal magnitude, thus more drag at higher speeds. Wave drag is essentially the same, but much, much stronger. Wave drag emanates as a result of shock waves, propagations in the air moving faster than the speed of sound. Shock waves contain a ridiculous amount of energy, thus greater opposing force on the aircraft. Let's look at an example. Here's a plane moving at a constant speed v and experiencing a constant drag force d. The plane accelerates by generating thrust f. As f increases, so too does v, and along with it, d. Once we reach a certain speed, called the critical Mach number, shock waves begin to form and wave drag takes effect. In order to maintain speed, thrust must go up, and in order to gain any speed, thrust must go up drastically, but increasing thrust is inefficient, and in plenty of cases, not possible. An engine can only provide so much thrust, but the reactive force provided by the air will always be able to match it. There is, however, another option, reducing wave drag. Earlier, I said that a smooth distribution of cross-sectional area reduces the formation of strong shock waves, or wave drag. Here's why this is important. We know from the area rule that any two airplanes with the same cross-sectional area distribution have the same wave drag. What this, and a bunch of really complicated calculus, allows us to do is create a body of revolution from our graphs of cross-sectional area. A body of revolution, in short, is basically when you take any two-dimensional shape and extrude it 360 degrees around an axis to form a solid, in our case the x-axis of our graph. If we were to test this newly created solid in a transonic wind tunnel, we could determine specific aspects of its wave drag. If I were an aeronautical engineer, from this point I would no longer think about the actual design of the craft, but instead about the design of the new object, and how I could optimize it. Now, 
I have neither a real or simulated transonic wind tunnel in which to test anything, but I can create bodies of revolution from the shapes on our graph. And if we were to take a closer look at them, it becomes evident, if it wasn't before, just how bad our LEGO airplane would actually perform. Not that it was surprising or anything. This process may seem mind-blowing and revolutionary, and when it was first conceived, it was. But the area rule isn't the end-all be-all of aircraft design. Wave drag was not the only thing that had to be accommodated for when creating an airplane. Wing shape, lift, carrying capacity, maneuverability, and engine design were, and still are, very important factors that must be considered in great detail when constructing an airplane. At the time, however, when engine technology had reached somewhat of a plateau, the area rule provided a unique way of solving the drag problem, and ultimately allowed craft of the era to operate faster than the speed of sound.